You can turn in your King James Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Why does God judge false converts by their works? You say, oh, no, no, brother, it's by their words. Uh, no, it's by their works. Let's look about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers, these aren't saved people, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their profession of whether they believed, whether they had faith in the blood, whether they believed in the grace of God, whether it, it doesn't say that, whose end shall be according to their works. Hmm, their works. Second Timothy chapter 4. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Huh. Um, Paul wasn't afraid to name names and actually name occupations just so uh, there would be no confusion. Okay. Um, this man did Paul much evil. Right. Um, you know, another place in Scripture, Paul talked about in perils among false brethren. And you will meet professing Christians that actually would like to throw you in jail and actually would like to destroy you financially, physically, whatever else, they will do you much evil. Mm -hmm. It isn't a matter of somebody saying, hey, you know what? I don't agree with you. You just have a good day. See you. Get away from me. No, no. These people will stalk you and they will try to destroy you. These false converts. And uh, God doesn't care about their profession. God cares about what they're doing after they make their profession of faith. Works meet for repentance. And again, we've I've talked about that thing until I've been blue in the face. You know, there needs to be works after salvation. I'm going to show you that in this study. Again, um, and I'll explain the difference between salvation by works, which is false, call that lordship salvation, and works meet for repentance that come after your conversion. Okay? I'll... Talk about that as we continue in this study. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. Again, another key scripture for you as a, as a New Testament Christian. They profess that they know God. They have the right profession. But in works, they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. You can profess that you know God all, all the day long. But if you're denying Him with your works, if you're not living for Jesus Christ... And I don't mean that you struggle with sin, okay? That's not the same thing as denying Him with your works, okay? Um, I'm saying people that have no conviction about sin at all, um, they're just wicked. They defend their wickedness. They defend their evil. There's just no Holy Spirit in their life. No fellowship of the Spirit that you'll see there. They can profess that they know God all they want, but it, if they're denying Him in, the, in those works there, um, if the spirit of truth is not there, they're lost. And it's very interesting because you actually, when you witness to people, you actually run into these exact people, the self-righteous. Self-righteous people actually condemn themselves with their own speech. They will actually line up perfectly with what I am preaching right now. You say, are you a good person to a self-righteous, you know, wicked, false convert? And they'll say, yeah, I think so. I'm not that bad. You say, well, what makes you a good person? They will never say, oh, well, um, I'm a wicked sinner, but Jesus Christ, His righteousness has been imputed to me. So that they won't talk about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They'll say, well, I've never stolen anything. I've never killed anybody. I mean, after all, I have, I've actually done quite a bit of work, charity work. Um, I, have, uh, I taught Sunday school for 30 years. Um, I did. I was actually filled in for my pastor quite a few Sundays. I've gone on countless mission trips. What are they doing? They're condemning themselves, you see. I just gave you three references in the New Testament in the Pauline epistles where Paul says false converts, ministers of Satan, okay? Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. 
and the religious atheists here in Titus 1.16, three different references where Paul says they're going to be judged according to their works, not according to their profession. And that's exactly what these people will do when you meet them. I'm a good person. And here's my proof. I've done this good thing and that good thing and this good thing and that good thing. That's not the mark of a saved Christian. Hey, are you a good person, Brian? Well, not really. I don't even know why God saved me, to be very honest. I'm, I'm just about as useless as you'd want to be. And I am. I'm not, I'm not joking here. Um, I've messed up so many things in my life. I've, I've done some of the dumbest things, and I, I struggle with sin, and, and I still do stupid, you know, think things and stupid things. Lord, I'm sorry. And, and, and uh, it's only the, only the blood of Jesus Christ that washed my sins away, and, and it's only His righteousness that's been imputed to me. That's the only way I'm getting into heaven. Good person? Uh, not really. <laughs> um, why callest thou me good, Jesus says. There's none good. Uh, I don't go around saying I'm a, I'm a good man. I'm a good person, you know. Uh, <laughs> not really. I'm a sinner. Just an old wicked sinner that God saved. I'm born again. All right? That's the difference there. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. A lot of people want to stop at verse 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Okay, what about verse 10? Now, I'm going to explain to you what the difference is between work salvation, lordship salvation, or you can also call it that, and salvation that produces good works after conversion. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto good works. Created in Christ Jesus, born again, unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And don't give me this little thing of, well, it says should. It doesn't say that you know, you're you supposed to. Again, I'll say it for the however manyth time that I've said this. The good works and the giving up of sin after you get saved is all positive. Why? Because all sin is negative. Can I say it again? All sin is negative. One more time with feeling. All sin is negative. Do you understand that? I don't know, brother. I like to get a little bit drunk in a while. Oh, you do? Really? You do? You do? You like the money that you have to spend to get drunk? You like the hangover that comes after your, your you know, poisoning of your body wears off? You like laying there on the floor in your own vomit? Wet yourself and things because you got so drunk? You enjoy that, do you? You like the drugs that you take? They put you into some weird state and you, and you wake up some other place and you think, okay, what's going on? How did I get here? You like being out of control of your body? You like covetousness, never being satisfied? You enjoy sin, do you? Why don't you come to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to get rid of these sins. I'm wrecking my life. I've made a mess of my life. God, please help me. You see, here's the, here's the way this thing works. A works salvationist is a good person. And they're coming along and they're saying, I'm not so bad, I'm not so bad. I've done, I'm not perfect. And somebody says, well, Jesus died for sinners. We're all, we all sin, you know, from time to time. And, and, and you can just pray this prayer and you get to go to heaven when you die. And they say, oh, great, you know, and, and, uh, what do I need to do? Okay, pray the prayer. Bow your head, every head, bow every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here for the first time, you'd like to pray this prayer, say, preacher, would you pray for me? And then now just pray, close your head and you go through the whole little thing and you come out and you say, well, I prayed the prayer. I'm going to go to heaven when I die now. This is great. I made a profession. I believed in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So there I go. Boom, I'm saved. And you say, um, so when did you, when were you broken? When was the time, when did the time come when you just realized how wicked you are and whatever? well, uh, you know, it's not there. It's not there with these people. See, the self-righteousness never goes away. They never come to the end of themselves. There's never a brokenness there. There's never contrition. In other words, I've sinned against God. If I could be put in a time machine and put back into the crowd there that's standing there watching Jesus dying on the cross, the self-righteous people would say, Oh, that's just terrible. I, I can't believe that this is happening and, and things. And, 
and he was such a nice guy. I mean, maybe I disagree with some of the things he did. Some of his methods were a little wrong. He's a little harsh sometimes. But, you know, oh, it's, it's such a shame that this is happening. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I hate to see some... That's self-righteousness. A truly born-again Christian goes back into that crowd and just falls down on their knees and weeps and just says, God, you, why are you letting him die like this for me? He shouldn't be dying. He shouldn't have to suffer like that for me. I, that's good. If, if you'll accept me as a sinner, I'll do my best, you Lord. You tell me what to do. You have my life. This is, you know, it's my fault that he's up there dying on that cross. Look at the pain he's in. That's me. I caused that pain. My sin caused that pain. My sin caused his suffering. God, I'm sorry. You see the difference? The works of righteousness that are done there in false converts' lives and in the life of a self-righteous sinner, those works of righteousness, you're just going along, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. Oh, Jesus died for me on the cross? Oh, cool, good, yep, I'll do that, yep, pray the prayer. Okay, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. That's what it is. And you can do that when you're a little child. You can go, you know, I'm two years old and I, I heard the Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. I pray the prayer, boom, I'm done, I'm in. You see? That's the difference there. And so you get these people, and it's all they talk about is the good things that they've done and their profession of faith that they have. They profess that they know God, you see. That's how this thing works. When you are a wicked, vile sinner, when you've been involved in sex perversion, and let me tell you something, there's no level of sex perversion, I believe, maybe pedophilia or something like that, I don't know, but the, if you're involved in sodomy and things, I mean, sodomites, I have sympathy for them because there's so much uh, gender confusion and things that's been infused into our society. I mean, women went transgender 100 years ago. Okay, don't give me this thing of, men are starting to wear dresses, what an abomination. Women started to wear pants 100 years ago and the Christians back then called it an abomination. The Christian ladies, ladies back then said, what an abomination, what are you putting men's clothing on for? Oh, but now it's okay because you get women's, you know, pants and things at the women's section. Go back 100 years ago, where was it? Equal rights, women's suffrage. Oh, I'm just as good as a man. I'm going to put on my husband's pants. Transgenderism 100 years ago is now accepted today. It's a vile abomination. But you get children that are raised in this thing and they're told, hey, if you don't look all that good and whatever else, maybe you're gay. And they go out and they mess around with that stuff and whatever else. And it's a, it's a sick, terrible lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying that because I hate people or whatever else. It is a sad lifestyle. You know, the real lifestyle is when you get married to a member of the opposite sex and then you have a child. And you get to hold that little baby and you look in, that, in the eyes of that little baby and their little hand comes up and touches your face. And you, and you talk to them and they start to smile and things. And you even get a little bit of laugh out of it. And you say, this is my child. Or if you want to be nutty like me and you actually deliver your own son, you know, and he comes out and my hands are the first to hold my son and I hold my son. What an amazing experience. And you'll never have it as a sodomite. Modern word, homosexual. You'll never have that. You'll never know that joy. You sterilize yourself. That's part of this whole thing. The modern sodomite push, all that stuff, it's about eugenics. That's another thing about it. Sterilize the planet. Get people to sterilize themselves. Tell them it's perfectly normal for you to sterilize yourself. You can always adopt or some kind of thing like this. You're sterilizing yourself. When you die as a sodomite, there's nobody there to declare your generation. No child can say, that was my dad that died or that was my mom that died or whatever else. You're not going to have that. Unless you artificially inseminate or you or adopt or something. It's not the same thing. You artificially inseminate. You know, in other words, you have, you take, you go to a woman, you go down to a, some sperm bank or whatever, you get that and the oh, hey, child came out. Yeah, who's the father? Oh, I remember uh, the, my, my, my child here that's artificially inseminated. They, they have the laughter of their father. Oh, that's right. I never knew the father. Boy, they sure have their personality of the father. Oh, that's right. I don't know the father. You see? But the vilest offender the vilest sinner out there can come along and they're not saying, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. 
if they are awake to any kind of reality of what they're in, they can come along and they can get to a point where they're broken. And the Lord will say, okay, how about it? I'll save you. Well, Lord, I, I can't clean up my life. And I can't, you, I'll help you with that. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. You can't do good works. You can't please the Lord as a vile sinner. You don't even have to be a pervert. You could be a drunkard. You could be whatever you want to say before your salvation. You can't please the Lord. And you get to a point where you're broken and you say, Jesus Christ is my only chance. He died to pay for my sins. God, if you'll accept me, I'll accept whatever conditions you put on me. I'll live for you. I'll do whatever it takes. You come to the Lord in that state and He'll save you. But if you come to the Lord in a self-righteous state, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, you know Jesus died for my sins. You know, they're not that bad. And, and I just kind of get and go on with my life and, and whatever else here. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Nope, God's not interested in you. And when somebody comes to you and they say, you're, are you a good person? Prove it. And you start to list off all your good works, you're going to be judged by that. You're going to get up there before the Lord someday and He's going to say, okay, uh, pretty good person, are you? Let's look at your uh, <clears throat> good works. Um, taught Sunday school, did this, gave to this charity, uh, was a pretty nice person here, took care of your wife and your children, your blah, 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 blah. Um, nope, sorry, still fell short. You weren't perfect. You didn't have Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed to you. Sorry, you're going to hell. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Titus chapter 2. There's so a bunch of devils out there, which I've talked about, you know, that, that talk about uh, the reprobate doctrine and sodomites can't get saved even if they turn from it and whatever else after their salvation. And they, and they come out with all this stuff. A bunch of just wicked, you know. Jesus' blood is just is limited, you know. Uh, it's Calvinism is all it is. Just Calvinism repackaged as, you know, and, and regurgitated as new IFB doctrine. Um, but, you know, the blood of Jesus is kind of weak. You know, Jesus Jesus never saw sodomy. He never saw any kind of a thing like that. And so when He died on the cross, He was just innocent. He's up there dying saying, well, this blood that I'm shedding, it, it should be good for most sins, I think. I think it should be pretty good. And, and then He got up, gets up to heaven and He sees two sodomites there and He goes, oh, I can't save that. I can't forgive that. My blood's not good enough to take care of that. <laughs> A weird God. That's, a, that's the thing that you understand. As, you, as a Bible-believing Christian, the more you study, you're going to realize how other systems of belief, they make God into, into the one of the biggest just, just dumb, idiotic beings that's ever been. You know? And in Bible-believing Christianity, God is just lifted up and lifted up and lifted up all the time. He's just constantly glorifying the Lord and realizing how great He is, how amazing He is, how merciful He is, how loving. But these other systems come along and you, you look and, oh, Jesus had to burn in hell to pay for sins. No Scripture. Where does it say that He burned in hell to pay for sins? It doesn't say that. You know, He shed His blood to pay for sins. You know, uh, Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. See, it's, it's always tear him, tear him down, tear Him down, tear Him down. Titus chapter 2, verse 6 through 15. Young, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Hmm, a pattern of good works. Talking to saved young men. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Oh, I have some friends that are post-tribbers and post-millennial and I'm millennial and, and we all just kind of get together and we have fun and I'm a King James only guy, but my other friends are ESV and NIV and this guy uses, you know, he just reads right straight from the Catholic Nestle's text and things and, and, and we, we all get along. How can you have uncorruptness in your doctrinal stands when you're hanging out with all these other people? And like I've said in other studies, where in the New Testament, where in the Pauline epistles are we ever told that we can agree to disagree on doctrine, issues of doctrine? There's only a few places where you can agree to disagree on. Celebration of holidays, okay? 
That's there, Romans 14. Your diet, also in Romans 14. Head covering. Okay, there's a couple things that you can agree to disagree on. And I've talked about that in other studies, so I'm not going to get into all that here. But doctrine, we're supposed to have uncorruptness. Gravity, sincerity. Young men, do you have that? Sound speech. Watch your language. That cannot be condemned. Oh, well, you know, brother, I can, I can say some, some words now and then and things like this. Um, what if the lost world hears you talking that way? Do you think that they're not going to condemn you? They're not going to look at you as a hypocrite? Oh, yeah, oh, holy Joe over here, but, you know, I've heard some pretty filthy words come out of his mouth. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's actually a very high standard. Lost people shouldn't be able to say anything evil about you as a Christian, as a born-again young man, young man, excuse me. How much work do you have to go before you can achieve that? I think you better get started. Verse 9, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, including sodomites. Okay? Don't limit the blood of Jesus Christ. Teaching us. God's grace teaches you something. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. It's not just young men, it's Christians. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So, oh, that's just the first century. We can live however we want to now. I don't think so. This present world is talking about this time that we are in in terms of you know, what we would call the church age and whatever. It's this present world, the world before God destroys it in the future. Um, don't tell me that you, you just can give up you know, righteous living there and living soberly, righteously, and godly. That's supposed to be there. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Works are supposed to be there. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Hmm. And yet you get the false converts that come out and they do despise a preacher that preaches against their perpetual living in sin. And I'm not saying you have to be sinlessly perfect, obviously. But these people that just defend it say, I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. See? And how dare you teach good works follow true conversion? How dare you teach that there's a new changed life? After walking around in this, how dare you teach that? Well, the Bible says, let no man despise thee. I don't care about you. My enemies out there that just constantly, you know, like devil-possessed lunatics that you are, just constantly watch what I do and listen to every little word and try to find anything you can, you know, say wrong about me and whatever else. Well, look, we proved that Denlinger is imperfect. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd tell you that myself, okay? Anybody that knows me will tell you that I'm, I'm imperfect, you know? <laughs> wow, wow, you're, you're such a, a soldier for Jesus there, yeah. Uh, not the Jesus of the Bible. But the Bible says here in verse 15, we're to rebuke with all authority. What are you rebuking? Um... I'm going to admit to something, and I've said this, I think, before in other studies, and I think we're all guilty of it. Um, we're guilty of being too soft 
having too much grace for false converts. And uh, somebody comes along and they say, I'm a Christian. You say, well, praise the Lord. Uh, no, um, it's, we got to start getting a little bit tougher. I mean, look at the standards. Look at the standards here that are given for a Christian, for young men, and for all Christians living soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Lift the standards higher. Don't tear them down. Rebuke with all authority. Hey, um, you know, the Bible says what you're doing there is wrong and wicked. You're telling me that you're a Christian and yet I'm seeing you do this. The Bible condemns what you're doing. Are you really saved? Are you born again? Why are you living this way? Why are you saying these things? Whatever. Judge. Righteous. Judgment. Rebuke with all authority. That's your authority right here. King James Bible. One more verse to read. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. As a lifestyle. Constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable in the men. And again, be careful to maintain good works. These are good and profitable. All the time, I get to people that attacking me and things. Don't we teach work salvation, whatever? I don't teach work salvation. I explained it in the study again. But the liars will just keep lying about me. But listen to what I'm actually saying. Helping you to maintain those good works and say, hey, you know what? It's not, you know, good works that, that saves you eventually if you keep doing the good works. No, 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 no. You get saved in there in the past. You see? You get saved. And then you start to go here and you start to live in good works and do good things. Why? These things are good and profitable unto men. Is it good to live back here with the serpents crawling on the ground and with cracks and darkness and you can barely see and there's a big cliff going down there and there's lightning flashing over here? Is that good? No, uh, actually it's good to come over here into the valley. And get some fresh spring water that's coming down from that mountain up there. And smell the, the breeze from the trees here and things. And get that good oxygen into your lungs. And, and get a good change of clothes there. The Christian life is a good life. Give up your alcohol. Why? Because alcohol is killing you. Give up your cigarettes. Why? Because it's killing you. And you go down through the list. We go through all the different sins that are out there. Every single one of them is negative. As I preach and preach and preach and preach. Like I'm supposed to. Rebuke with all authority. God put me in this position of, of ministry, of leadership and ministry. And I'm telling you, hey, I'm going to rebuke you with all authority. The authority of the scriptures. Not because of my holy papal decree or something like this. The Bible's against it. I'm going to rebuke you if I see you doing it. You need to be careful to maintain good works. But false prophets, false converts, um, I just find it so interesting that they will actually be judged according to those works, that they profess that they're a good person. So I hope you see the difference there. Um, just an interesting thing the Lord kind of put in my mind and, and um, I want to do this little study on that. Uh, I just, I find it so disturbing that, that there are so many Christians that just get so messed up and, and, you know, led astray and all kinds of things and whatever. And a lot of times it's, it's other professing Christians that'll mess you up too, by the way. And, um, the reason for that is because we're just not holding our standards high enough. Um, but it all starts with that conversion and you get somebody that comes up to you and they say, I'm a Christian. Um, you need to ask them some questions. Don't just say, oh, praise the Lord. That's great to hear. Boy, that's, that's neat. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, you need to ask some, some questions to them. Um, if they're still in their self-righteousness and they still have that self-righteous pride, you're dealing with a lost convert. I don't care what they profess. I don't care what they say they believe and, and whatever else. I mean, I have, I, I have met some of the worst false converts in my life, have been King James only, quote-unquote, Bible-believing, Baptist, whatever's um there's some of the worst out there 
Uh, why? Well, because Jesus Christ is counterfeited by Satan. Um, like we read earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, okay, talks about the devil you know, being transformed into an angel of light and his ministers being transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Um, the most satanic men that walk this earth are not in uh, the brothels or, or in drugs or in whatever. They're in church buildings. Mark that down. Remember that. Okay, that's important. So that's going to be it for this video. Uh, I pray that you take heed to this thing. Go through Titus chapter 2 sometime, by the way. Examine yourself. The Bible talks about that the, the Word of God is like a, is like a glass, that you, that you look into that glass and you see the reflection of yourself. You see your sins, you see your wickedness, and the Lord starts to convict you and say, hey, that stuff in your life, that needs to go. You know, if you're just watching these videos for entertainment's sake and you go, oh, that felt kind of convicting. It kind of gave me a little bit of a rush there when he yelled about such sin or whatever else. And, and then you just go, okay, I want to see what else is on. Let's go watch some other video or let's go do some other thing. And you, and you forget what manner of man you are or woman. Um, you're missing the picture. Okay? You're missing out big time. Uh, the Holy Spirit, when you get convicted about a sin, you better start taking care of that thing. Um, you're not doing all these good works to one day get saved. That's work salvation. You need to come to the end of yourself and say, I'm not a good person. Get saved. Call out to the Lord for Him to save you. Okay? But after you get saved, the Lord's going to come in and he's, He is going to start to direct and lead in your life and say, okay, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. And you, and you need to do that. It's good and profitable. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.